Притрува. Тискам. Абди Ванко. Ванко. Good afternoon, everyone. So, yeah, uh, I hope all of you all are eagerly awaiting this session. <clears throat> so, we have in our midst Mr. Prashant. Uh, he has secured All India Ranks MT8 this year. A stupendous achievement. All of you all, I just request to give a very big round of applause for that because uh, I have had a personal experience in writing the exam also. I did end up clearing the exam. So I know how tough it is to clear this exam and that too, he has done it in his first attempt at such a young age. It's an achievement par excellence and therefore it should be a great source of inspiration to all of y'all. Often what happens in this examination, I wouldn't take too much of my time because this is his day today. Uh, often what happens in this examination is there is a lot of uh, negativity in terms of, oh, it'll take a lot of attempts for you to clear three, four, five. It goes on and on and on as though it's a five-year program. No, it's not. Prashant is a classical example wherein if you have the method and if you have the discipline, you will be able to clear this exam. And that is the message that we also want to give from our end. So without any further delay, I would request Prashant to take over the word. Thank you, Prashant. Hello, everyone. So how are you guys feeling? <coughs> there are 60 days more, I guess, to the prelims. So how do you feel now? Let's keep it interactive, no? So, so that it doesn't seem like a monologue. I don't want to feel like a monologue at least. Just come on, someone come up with whatever you feel like. Okay. Okay, so let's start with that. My journey into UPSC per se was around eight months odd. So it's it's a pretty short phase. And that might sound something surreal or probably not something that you can believe, but then that's how it was. And the worst part is always about the prelims is what I feel personally. The mains and the interview is relatively way, way comfortable. Mains can be done even after prelims. It's not the case that you need to do it way before. I totally feel that all the attention needs to be at least for the next 60 days, considering that a sizable amount of time has already gone through. So considering that for the next 60, the plan has to be only for prelims is what I feel. Considering that prelims has been you know, getting uh, tougher day by the day. And last year, all of us probably were, were taken by a shock, and so was I. In fact, my first reaction on seeing the paper was probably you know, when I started counting the number of questions where it said one option correct, two correct, three correct, four correct. And there were 54 such questions. So only 46 questions, which probably had one single right answer without having to look up all the four options. Naturally, elimination method was eliminated. And all the cliche techniques that we all had probably, you know, were, were vanquished in last year's prelims. And probably that's why, or that's probably why the cutoff also is pretty low. Supposedly, it was speculated to be some, uh, somewhere around 75, the general category and so on. So that's how, you know, good the prelims paper was. And sometimes it's all about, you know, trusting your intuitions, seeing how many you can attempt in the prelims and, you know, trying to cross the prelims is ultimately your aim. It doesn't need to be, unless and until you're thinking for the forest services, which probably I was in because MBBS per se is ineligible for the forest services and hence I could not even apply for the forest services. So that's a different spectrum. But see, but then like if getting through the prelims is all, you know, that you need. And for that, you need to check out on the ideal number of, questions which you need to attempt. And considering that there's a one-third negative marking, you definitely need to be extremely cautious about the number of questions you attempt as well. And it's, it's about choosing, you know, the right number of questions and the right questions which you choose to attempt. Like say, in all my mocks, whichever I had taken, most often, you know, I used to sit at my home screen and just do it. And I used to complete the paper by say one, one hour, 15 minutes. That's how fast I was working because either I know or I don't know. There is no in between. If there is a question which I had to juggle through, I never had the patience to sit and think a lot. But then I would, I would just, you know, click through some option or like leave the questions. And I kind of understood the sweet spot as to, you know, not the number of questions that were needed to be attempted. And that somehow came around to say 85. 
So I, I understood, okay, fine. I had this initial thought process that probably I had to attend all 100. I attempted all 100. I used to land up getting somewhere around 60 for 200. So, okay, then I thought probably I needed to change my game, play it a little differently. And then that's how, you know, I started finding out, okay, so I cut down on the number. I started attempting 90, understood where I stood, then came down to 80. Then again, I found out where I stood. So it's somewhere in between is what I felt. And that's where I, you know, clung, uh, cling myself to 85. But if you ask me if I did the same thing in the actual prelims, then the answer is a big no. Because it's again all about your intuition. I understood that it was, you know, the Gandhiji's fa famous slogan of do or die. Either you perish or you get through. That's all. There are only two options. Nothing more, nothing less. So I had to narrow it down and I chose to attempt. Okay, say, let's take a guess. How many do you think I attempted? Sorry? Okay. Any other? We'll take some four more guesses. Go on. Okay, 65 then. 80 then. Two more guesses, and I'll tell you what I uh, did. Sorry? I didn't get you. <laughs> 45, 40, that's extremely low, but then, okay, fine. What else? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the average of what you both said, 90 and 100. So I attempted 95. And my score also, somehow I just calculated with three to four different keys and all put together, the score also came to somewhere around 98. So fine, it was a decent strike rate. But, but then, yeah, it, it was more of a retrospective thought that I chose to you know do it at 95. And why 95 is because I understood that probably, see, the people say you have to do it in three rounds, you know, trying to analyze. But then when the whole question paper is going to be Greek and Latin, I don't think even three rounds help. That is how, you know, how good I landed at. Like I hardly knew, I would say, 15 questions for sure. Exactly 15. Like I started counting the number of questions. I could say, okay, right, this is the perfect answer. There's nothing more to it, nothing less. And probably even that would be wrong. <laughs> That's how it is. So with 15 questions, I, I'm so sure that I could have been nowhere near clearing. And I understood somewhere, you know, getting somewhere around 85 at least for such a tough paper was what I needed. And in that case, I had to attempt questions where I was probably confused between two options, then go for questions where I was confused between three options. And when it's all about a number game, say two are correct, three are correct, then how do you think, you know, I will be able to take a gamble at it? So when everything is going to be a tough, you know, situation, then probably you have to go for the worst option possible. And that's how I chose 95. Probably I would have gone for 100 as well, but then I chose not to do 100 because of negative scoring. I thought, okay, fine, let's just leave at least five so that, you know, it just helps. And sometimes you just have to trust your, you know, intuitions, I would say. It's all about intuitions when it comes to prelims because you, you need to choose. It's not the mains where every, all 20 on 20 are there. You need to write everything. Again, optional paper is a different thing. That though, that is, that is something, you know, best left for your judgment, but as far as the other mains papers are concerned, there is nothing much you can do about it. But for the prelims, that is an option. So you need to exercise that option wisely is what I feel. So identify your strong areas. It could be geography, it could be economics, it could be history. And me as a medical graduate, I had no such strong area because everything was new to me. <laughs> and learning something new all of the sudden is not going to be an easy task. Like I'm no expert in it. And the only place that I found extremely tough was geography and Geography, I felt relatively for the prelims was not so so much like it was more of a limited spectrum for uh, the prelims is what I feel. More often for the mains, you have a lot more questions, while more of uh, more of the thrust is on history, it's on economics and polity naturally. And this time we had quite a few questions from IR too. So I think these are certain areas which probably every single person who you see will tell you to read. And I kept the uh, and, and I kept geography for the last thing and. I think even if someone had read geography this time, probably they might not have gotten everything or even half of the things right because most of it were, you know, kind of questions from international or economics based geography. It wasn't really from the physical geography part that people, you know, read and come up with. So UPSC is quite known for throwing up such surprises and that's, you know, how smart you need to handle those. And when it comes to the resources, I have nothing new to offer because every single person reads the same old resources. If it's Paul T, it's Lakshmi Kant, and everyone knows the Bible. 
basically of these resources. And I don't think uh, reading a different resource actually helps, provided it's you know something totally out of the random. You know, if you feel a resource is doing good for you, I think you should just probably go ahead with it and stick to you know having a limited number of resources because that ultimately is what helps at the end of the day. Like they do say revision, but I per se do not believe in last minute revision more so because you will not be able to still revise every single thing. And it is about the long term memory that you are able to recollect. And hence active recall is what is more important when you start solving questions probably. That is why you know you get confused between probably if it were 1948 August or if it was January 1948 and so on. There's something on the flag code or something and I remember getting that wrong because I was confused between the month. And that is how nuanced UPSC wants you to learn. So when it comes to the prelims, I think that's exactly where the tough part is. And for the next 60 days, if you ask me what you know, I would suggest you to do, consider that you take my advice also with a pinch of salt. You know, there is no rule of thumb, there is no absolute technique, and what works for one does not work for the other. That's how personalized it is about uh, prelims, mains, or the interview stage as a whole. Sure. Yeah, sir, yeah, fine. Yeah, so that is how personalized, you know, things can be for you. So apart from that, for the next 60 days, say, 30 days, it needs to be about your preparation for the maybe prelims, maybe the last minute, ready reckon on notes that you have, or it could be the faculty's teachings, it could be uh, standard textbooks. Whatever you feel is your resource, go through it for the next 30 days. Like, probably you might be weak at some subject, and you could be strong at something else. And I think you need to decide it more on the basis of the number of questions that they ask in the prelims. Say if economics is a place that you're weak at, but then there are quite a few questions from economics, then probably that's not something that you can afford to lose. So you need to know where you can lose, where you can gain, and that's it's a calculated balance that you have to use between the two that will you know end up getting you the requisite score that you need. And recent days we see more the thrust on current affairs and you know questions being put on IR quality, everything on a current affair note. So it's not been like a traditional, you know, UPSC paper which has stuck to all those resources. People used to say Lakshmikant was the Bible, but then even Lakshmikant doesn't render you all these all the questions ditto, you know, word by word verbatim. So in such cases, you'll probably have to apply your conceptual knowledge alongside. So that's why you know the element of revision comes into play. So whatever you read for the static part that needs to be linked with the dynamic part as well. You know, see a link and see that reference as to why probably they've asked you a particular question. See if the flag code was there for my prelims, it was because the Azadika Amrit Mahotsav was being celebrated across the year and there was a national flag day into the news and it was celebrated with great fervor, you know, across the timeline. So that's why, you know, you need to link what you read and probably read it at a little more depth. And if it's for the first attempt, naturally your depth is going to be way too lesser as compared to someone who's been into two or three or or maybe extra number of attempts. So that being the case, even more cautious does it need to be for you to clear prelims because as the number of attempts increase, naturally your expertise increases while uh, you know the way you present in mains is def uh, totally different because I think mains is more of a level playing field for a person who's done you know five attempts or, or a first attempt. But the prelims is more often biased towards the number of attempts is what I personally feel. So in such cases, you know, for the next 30 days revising and the next and the furthermore 30 days, which probably will land you to the prelims is where you need to take up as many tests as possible. Probably say even three tests a day is fine. Just look up those questions where you go wrong or where you have zero clue about and you've still gone to attempt. And even if you have zero clue about a question, probably I don't know if this trick works, but my answer, you know, to half the questions where only two options are correct. You ask me anything, I'll blindly go. Only two options are correct. Either B or C is the answer. I don't know if that works always, but at least it worked once. So I hope it works again. As long as you know UPSC wants to surprise you again and put put you into answering none of the options are right or all the options are right. Maybe some trends do sometimes work in UPSC. And most often, from my observation in the papers, I've always seen that you know all the options are correct is always wrong. None of the options are correct is also always wrong. Either it's two or three. They want you to eliminate something but then you'll be stuck between no between two options probably so these are often you know things that upsc actually gets to do with respect to the prelims and the importance of previous uh, previous year questions cannot be you know understated because 
that happens to be the only resource which is confined with the UPC corridor itself. People, you know, can cite you sources saying, this question probably came from this book, and you know, they can show you a book from medieval India or ancient history, you know, a 500 page book, because I remember someone quoting a book, you know, by Bashir or someone, a historian, and that was 500 pages, and I don't think uh, someone would be able to read 500 pages just to answer a question from ancient India or medieval India or from Buddhism and Jainism. Though some are low hanging fruits, I will not expect you to, you know, read every single thing in ancient and medieval India, but it doesn't mean that you skip ancient and medieval as a whole and go. That is totally not something that is expected. You need to know everything. In fact, UPSC wants you to be a jack of all trades and master of none. To, you know, to keep it very low key, that's how they expect you to be. They want you to read up everything. They want you to know almost anything and everything about something. But then you don't have to, you know, go deep down there. Of course, going deep down gets you added marks and mains. But in prelims, I think it's all about, you know, answering at least or if you get through, it's okay. That's how they want you to do. They asked the question on the finance commission, you know, percentages and the splits uh, for forest ecology. They gave the percentages and they wanted us to, you know, tell us to what all the parameters were. So they want you to mug up as well, basically. Low key, that is also about mugging up. It cannot always be the case that you, you know, you conceptually understand everything. I mug nothing. That's not happening. You need to mug up. In fact, humanities, I, I believe, is a lot more about mugging up and partly about, you know, understanding the reasoning behind it. But it needs to be nuanced. It needs to be balanced. So it's about striking a right chord between the two is always what I feel. And as many questions you attempt, your marks will definitely increase. My first test also would have been probably something that I landed up getting at, say, 50, 60. And geography and all, it used to be at 20, 30. That was how pathetic I was in geography. And for the other test, it has to be somewhere around 60s. So considering that, with every successive test, you will see your score improve to somewhere around 90. In fact, I, I did give the open test here as well at Vajiram. And the open test somewhere 100 around is what I got. But let me tell you that, you know, getting a score of, say, 60 or 100 in a mark will not make a difference because at the end of the day, it is only that one single paper at UPSC that counts. And people who get 60 also land up getting 100 in the UPSC paper and vice versa. And there have been my own friends who have been doing even way better than me in mocks, but then, you know, who probably didn't land up getting into the uh, UPSC prelims paper. So it's all about the matter of luck you have that day. I cannot understate the importance of luck as well, and probably you need to count your stars. And if you if you're an atheist, good to go still. <laughs> so that's all about your personal belief. But then I think trust and confidence upon one, you know, one's personality and perspective is also pretty important in this process because at the end of the day, you need to trust the process as well. You really cannot throw everything to the factor of luck, nor everything to the factor of smart work, because smart work doesn't, you know, totally mean just doing a calculated decision, but it's also about the hard work and, you know, the efforts that you put through. And consistency is something that is very important, especially at the last leg of the preparation, because the last 60 days is what, you know, probably counts, and that's going to turn your uh, tables topsy-turvy, probably. Like, it, it, can, it can either make or it can break. And what you choose is totally upon you. So there are people who might feel still dejected, probably. Some might feel that they've not done, you know, the mains prep as yet. Or some might feel that even prelims is half-baked. Everything is totally fine. These are all the kind of emotions that probably even I experienced. In, in fact, until the last day or maybe once even my prelims paper went, I came out, my friends were waiting, and I told them, I'm not getting through this paper, so you just have this paper. And I just threw it on his face, and I left. I told him, you, when the key comes, just sit, calculate with this. I'll go finish the CSAT paper. But then I'm not talking about this anymore. And, and I, of course, though I can say I'll not talk about this, but then, you know, there is this natural urge that you want to know the answers for certain questions that you deliberate. And all the answers I started seeing were all wrong. I was, I was like, OK, fine. So this attempt, I'm not getting through. And then, then I phoned up my mom and I said, I'm not getting through this attempt. So just forget it as it is. And uh, let me just go for CSAT and you know sit. And then I was like, I was in for a shock because CSAT is something that I thought was probably the easiest for me. Not because uh, it's not like I ever had maths you know, as a part of my curriculum. But then, because I was already an NTSC scholar, so we do have a mental ability paper for the same, and it's an exam conducted by the government of India. So I was always confident of doing the CSAT, but then I was in for a shock, and that is actually when I totally thought that I was on a wrong foot. And CSAT was a place where, again, I had to revamp my strategy within the exam hall, because 
I was someone who always thought that probably English comprehension is going to be confusing and you know I needed to shift my focus more into blood relations, you know throwing the dice around and you know finding out phi comes, six comes, one dot, two dots, Venn diagrams, pie charts. I thought that these are the easiest that you know someone can go for and probably gain 60 odd marks and I always believed okay what's the big fuss in you know getting 60. That's how I really felt but then you know CSAT it could do every single thing possible and when I came out of CSAT I was like see it feels like you know CSAT is the paper that I would probably fail and even I would get through the GS right now. So that is how I totally felt at the end of CSAT and and the worst part being you know I was okay happy saying fine if GS has not gone well and I fail in GS and then even if I fail in CSAT I don't really care because I've already failed in GS. Only thing if I've cleared GS and I fail in CSAT is when you know I would curse my life myself for all the life and that's how I felt and then these guys came and said you pass I and I was like what how the hell did it happen and then they were like you've landed up getting somewhere around 100 and they said I've checked with three to four keys. Then I was like in for a shock. Now the worst part is about CSAT and if I don't clear CSAT I'll I'll never be able to forgive myself is how I totally felt. So CSAT is probably not something that you should take in for a joke because UPSC also has understood the fact that people do take it for a ride. And that's how you know they've totally changed the way you approach to CSAT and I'll tell you what I did in the exam hall because at the, at the start I did solve mathematic problems. It was at least 9th standard when I uh, you know knew the formula to calculate 2 to the power n and what the unit digit was and I started multiplying 2 into 2 into 2 and <laughs> <laughs> and I never got the answer at the end of the day and I wasted 10 minutes. That was how much I wasted for a single question in maths. And at the end of one hour I saw probably that I solved some 15 questions with huge difficulty and I get an answer and that answer wouldn't be in all the four options. I was like either I was wrong or the question paper setter was wrong. Probably I thought okay. So he took it from some book where everything was wrong. <laughs> and then I assumed okay fine safely everything is going wrong which means I need to change my strategy and I ran into English comprehension, started attempting every single comprehension possible like a wild ass and I really didn't understand you know at one point as to what the option was and what he was expecting me to answer. That's how uh, confusing English comprehension can be and, and the reason why I've never chosen English comprehension more often is more because you never know a definitive answer and everyone can give you a key and ultimately UPSC will have a third key to it. In fact I remember one of the papers I think 2018 or 19 I don't remember but one of the papers the UPC key had a lot of mistakes and no one could do anything about it because naturally UPSC releases it uh, you know way way after everything has ended. So what's the use in it then? Basically you need to be of course it could be the UPSC's fault but at the end of the day you are the sufferer. So you, you'll have to be cautious about how you tread the path and that's why you know I think English comprehension helped me because I started attempting every single thing and I ran out of time at the end of 1 hour 58 minutes or so. I completed say 53 questions and I was like okay fine there is nothing that I can do about this right now and either I start you know attempting option C for every single question or go for option B. That's something that I thought but then I felt probably I just count my stars and just give the paper at 54. I, I just finished one last answer and I gave it at 54 questions and when I just came out I was trembling and probably thought you know that the CSAT was a flunked option and my juniors did check the paper. I, I didn't have the courage to or I couldn't master the courage I'll say to check my own paper. So I just gave it to him and he, he took some random key and checked it and he was like what if Ambati Naladanga like 54 questions I attempted and probably I was landing up getting say 60, 60 or 55 somewhere around. I was like this is nowhere close so I'm not getting and then I started checking it on my own. I took up at least different keys because I knew English comprehension was a place where people will give you different answers and UPSC has its own key. So I started checking and then somewhere around 66, 272 I was getting based on different keys and then I understood okay I have a chance or I don't have a chance but then it's for UPSC to take a you know guess at it. And when the results came naturally by God's grace I should say I, I somehow got through. But then retrospectively if I look it up CSAT was the place where you know I went wrong and probably I should have put in more efforts. Second, English comprehension I felt was underestimated but then that is probably a place which can help you because if you answer say like 20 questions you can probably get 13 to 15 right. That is still a possibility. So that can always help you. So answering the English comprehension first definitely helps. 
try to pick out the questions even amongst maths or the logic based questions whichever it is try to pick out those questions which you think are easily solvable because they give you some set of questions which are like which you solve for 10 minutes and you still you don't get the answer or you get a wrong answer or it's so lengthy to get that answer and sometimes there are questions which can you know yield the answer in a minute so probably it's wise to you know take 5 minutes to at least skim the paper once and check you know those questions which probably could have answered better because like i just came home and when i started flipping through the pages i was like why didn't i attend this question instead when i very well knew how to solve it so those are you know four things which i felt in csat which i went wrong as far as gs is concerned i think the place where i went wrong was more often you know questions like the finance commission parameters countries bordering israel or whatever russia i think was asked these these are actually low hanging fruits and i got all of them wrong trust me i got those wrong but what i got right was all the tougher questions like probably which others would have gotten wrong i got those right and what i got wrong you know people got it right that's how it works so sometimes it's about you know understanding which questions can be attempted the choosing the right questions the right answers naturally and taking a calculated guess and a bait maybe people say solving it in three rounds but i would rather say that you solve it as it is but then see as to how for sure you can go with the options if there are quite a few questions say at least 60 odd that you start attempting where you know with practice it comes but if you get 60 odd correct if you are very sure of getting it right then there is no necessity to of course go for something more so it's all about that calculation and that comes through mock tests that is exactly where the importance of mock tests come in come into play and you should probably take up the mock tests here on a regular basis as well because hard work counts consistency counts and even if you leave one week out i'm sure i'm so sure you know people start forgetting facts and so was i like you need to be in touch with the subjects at least skim through the subjects this is not a point where you can you know revise or read everything verbatim word by word you will have to skim but skim it fast see to that you skim it multiple times skim it fast and you know it needs to be at a point it needs to be muscle memory or photographic memory as they call it it has to be very reflexive that you see you answer that's how it needs to be at a point and once you clear the prelims mains or interview is you know a cake walk really trust me it's indeed a cake walk because as long as you can manage to write something in english it's more than enough as long if you have a regional language you know being put up for your gs papers then it's a different strategy but when it comes to just writing the mains papers i think even minimal practice will do and the duration between prelims to mains is so curated that you'll still be able to you know get through with whatever you've read for the prelims honestly that was actually the case with me because i didn't have much time to you know prepare separately for the mains give different papers or, or do all that more often very minimal is what i've actually given to be honest extremely minimal you search anywhere on the net you will hardly be able to get any paper of mine because that is the least i've ever written <laughs> so you really cannot expect beyond that and the mains test series of course this is a reputed institute and you could take it up here as well you know to go on with the test series and probably you should get the evaluation done so that you get to know the shortcomings because the role of evaluation i feel is more to find out the mistakes of others not your mistakes per se you get to learn from their mistakes and then you don't repeat them because naturally we do a mistake we often repeat whoever tells us that's how you know it is naturally no unless and until you've done it 1001 times the 1000 second time probably you won't do but if it's you know a mistake which you do once or twice you'll probably do it a third time as well and that comes very spontaneously especially when it when you're given say 7 minutes to write i don't think that is something you can you know afford to do and in in fact for the mains part I, let me just tell you on a very brief experience on my mains part because um so yeah okay so gs1 essay was where i think i went utterly wrong essay i misconstrued the topic on feminism i thought it was purely a feminism topic and uh, there was a topic on girls are weighed down by restrictions and boys with demands two equally harmful disciplines and i must consider the topic is boys with demands being the demands which boys raise on girls and not and not the demands that are being placed on boys so my whole topic went as though i wrote only half the topic and nothing on the other half so i think probably that would have been a very damaging score for me of course the marks are not out so i really can't be a soothsayer in uh, you know speculating that but this is something that i found myself into being as a flaw that was one gs1 again in for a shock because i didn't know what fods was i've never heard of the term fods to be honest at least one of my friends was smart enough to identify that it was something to do with switzerland 
but I had no no such idea either. I, I knew it was probably something to do with erosional, depositional, glacial, some landform, some water form, something, but I didn't know what it was and what what really could I write. So I, I only wrote two lines in it. Again, a mistake. You should have written something, fill the page. It's okay, you write rubbish, it's totally fine. Still fill the page. Spend instead two minutes or three minutes for that question when you know nothing. And there are always generic points that come for help. If you really ask me, if you know, based on my probably the rank and the level of expertise that I wrote with, let me tell you that UPSC does not expect you to, you know, be a scholar and write everything like a scholar. It's okay if it's an average answer, it's okay if it's an above average answer, it'll still work, provided you're able to do, you know, a decent presentation out of it. Let me again tell you my own techniques, but none of it probably might work. In fact, it's just the parallel or opposite to what is being traditionally told. I never got the time to underline any of the keywords in any of the papers. Hardly did I underline the, underline in the sense the keywords, like probably say, when they come to grab your paper, that is when I would have underlined, say, for five answers, and then they snatch the paper and they go. That's how it was, because I believed in more of writing than underlining something. I drew the least number of diagrams possible, but again, something which I'll tell you should not be done. Try to draw as many diagrams as possible, provided it adds to a value addition. Don't put up a diagram just because it needs a diagram. It needs to have some value addition in it. If there is something that you can put into a diagram, and then it saves your time, or even if it doesn't save your time, it makes it look attractive. But then you don't write the same old stuff which you've put in the diagram again in points, then it's totally fine. But if you do the same old thing, then I don't think you're going to get anything extra. It, it'll totally be the same. It is as good as just writing the point and leaving it instead of putting the diagram out in the open. So I think that, again, needs to be controlled. And when you put a diagram, also ensure that you label it appropriately or put up a side heading to it as to what it explains. Just a you know, map of India you know, hanging in the balance doesn't work. That's not how at least it needs to be presented like. And give subheadings, of course, right in points, at least because that's, this is what I did. Let me just tell you what I did because I really don't know what works, what doesn't work, because I just believe that what I did worked, safely assuming you know that way. And of course, writing main test series definitely does help, but you need to calibrate it with the level of pre preparation as well, because at the end of the day, it's again nuanced. You need to have a balanced approach between writing papers because you just can't go on and on writing papers without preparing, and it can't be the other way around as well. So at one point, you need to give papers, even if you're not prepared. But understand where that point comes from. Probably when you're 30 days away, that's why you start. You have to start writing papers at any cost. You cannot afford to still stop, wait, and say, OK, fine, I'll just finish everything and then come back. That's not going to happen. If, if that happens, then probably we should see you next year for the next attempt. And three, after writing in points, giving the subheadings, intro, body, and conclusion is something that everyone tells you. I'll tell you the same. And intro, the safest part, write something. Write something which is either linked to a current affairs or if it has something relevant to a constitutional article. People, everyone, I think, will tell you the same thing. More often, I would go in with something which was relevant to current affairs. Anything that I knew uh, with respect to the current affairs, I would link it to an introduction and write it. Conclusion, have a list of all the committees possible on Earth. I would say on Earth because it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's an international committee or if it's a committee, you know, which is in... India, but naming any random committee, even if the examiner doesn't know, okay, fine. If he's written a committee, adds to adds to a value. That's all. You really can't expect the examiner to know everything, and and the key is not going to be exhaustive of whatever you write. So beyond a point, whatever you write, right or wrong, is taken into consideration and given some mark, if not an extraordinary mark. If what you write is relatable to him, probably you get an extraordinary score. Bluff, but bluff confidently and relatably. It doesn't. It shouldn't be something that you write, you know, out of stretch of imagination. And then, you know, naturally he finds and, you know, catches hold of you and then he understands, okay, everything that this guy has written is wrong. And from what I am given to understand, they correct it in different stages. There are different people who correct your papers, at least four different people who do that, you know, for the respective subjects. And that way, every answer is in independently evaluated on the face value. Whatever you write for that answer, then and there, you get score. So. Maybe for an answer, you get eight. For another answer, you could land up getting two. So it's not like, okay, he's written this answer very good. So that answer will also get you, you know, seven or eight marks. That's not going to happen. And forget the level of stretch of marks, but at a point, you need to be sure that probably, you know, whatever you write, 
it needs to be relatable. It needs to be at least okay-ish. It, it doesn't need to be perfectly right. It is okay to make mistakes. But ensure that you quote some statistic, some relevant report, at least in the brackets, you know, find a credible source for it. If you don't remember the source, still fine. Write some source. It's, it's totally okay again. <laughs> these are not all, these are all not, you know, conventional things that probably people will do. But I still think it is okay because people will not be able to sit and verify whatever you write for every single question into every single paper. One person might do, but how will every single person do naturally? So these are probably, I think, certain little different smart techniques. And if you ask me for the essay paper, what I, I don't even know the marks in my essay paper, but then probably I'll tell you what worked for the first essay because the second essay was, you know, a part rubbish. I wouldn't say again entirely because it's, a, it's all about perspectives. And if someone liked my essay, probably they gave me marks. So let alone the second essay. For the first essay, I chose the topic on two sides of a coin, you know, being on opposite ends. There's some topic, thinking is a game, it happens on opposite ends. This was something which the outline said, the first topic, and, uh, and I had the opportunity to write that. So I did jot out the points for the first five to 10 minutes as to what all I had to do, what all I had to write. And then like give as many dimensions as possible, think of as many examples as possible, and have ready-made anecdotes. And topless copies are always the best you know, source, resource I would feel. Everything that I've grabbed, I think, is from some topper or the other snatch hold of their notes or maybe if they put it in telegram and probably I never had any notes because I never had the time to make notes nor the energy because they've already made one and what I make is just as a replica of that then then it doesn't make sense but what you need to know what you need to do instead is to have that one page handouts or something which you could revise for the mains break rather you have an interval say I think my mains paper was between 9 to 12 and then 2 to 5 I think so between 12 to 2 you have a lunch break which means that is the place where you need to revise. And for that, you cannot have your book and handouts. So you need to have something where you have everything jotted down that you forget. It cannot, again, be you know 10,000 pages. It needs to be, say, 10 pages max, which you can probably look up. And, and my whole preparation into ethics was that way. Because ethics was all snatch hold of this fellow's answer. <laughs> write it. Take that, write it. Cut, copy, paste. In fact, lexicon was a source that I used. But lexicon was more for me to flip through pages and probably take definitions out of it. But otherwise, examples and stuff, random, you know, catch hold of all the philosophical theories possible on Earth. Again, whether you believe it or not, you have to write those philosophies. It really doesn't matter because you need to get into the services. That's all that matters. Your personal ideologies on an answer totally don't reflect what you actually carry out. And when it comes to answer writing, it's all about, you know, cooking up the right broth, which he wants you to do. So. For so that, you have to mix up every single topper's copy answers. That's what I feel with respect to ethics. If, if there is one point source for ethics, I think there's none. It's all about how many ever copies you can see and, and kind of understand, you know, if you have a decent command over English, I feel ethics and essay are papers where you'll be able to get through very comfortably. And you can probably, you know, throw your thrust into other papers. It, it just makes it easier. But then you need to, again, ensure that you have the right theories, the philosophies, and everything, and you're able to, you know, collate that and fit it into that particular question which is being asked. So the presentation is what matters with respect to the ethics paper is what I feel, and and the points that you bring to the table. And novelty is always rewarded in UPSC is what again I felt. So anything that you write novel, anything that you write differently, the way you approach again, you know, is being rewarded. And my essay in general, I generally give it a touch of an English literature optional student. Someone who reads my paper will kind of feel that, not because of the English that I use, but because of the quotes that I try to ca catch hold of and write. Probably, you know, most often we see our papers being quoted. Of course, I don't write something like Vikram Greval's essay. That is not something that I will be ever able to do. And I have great regards for Sir, and his essays are top notch. Hands down, you know, I'll not be able to do that. I'll tell you this. But what differently can be done is probably, you know, take up 8th standard, 9th standard, well, CBC textbooks of English, catch hold of, you know, quotes of English literature, probably, you know, I still remember quoting The Merchant of Venice, and then Romeo Juliet, Julius Caesar, and then, say, The Mirror by Sylvia Plath, and then The Red Ransom Chief. These were all, you know, some short stories or poems or anecdotes, which probably we read in, read in our schools and probably for, forgot that, but then, like, 
you know, the quality of mercy is not drop, uh, it's not strained. A drop it gently as the rain. Friends, lovers, countrymen, lend me your ears. These are, you know, some standard uh, quotes from all these English literature excer excerpts. And I think I used all these into writing into my paper. So someone who reads my paper will probably think that, okay, he's been an English literature student. So he's quoted all this exactly verbatim from those papers. And naturally, there will be a bias. See, people who are correcting your essay papers are English professors. And why would they want to, you know, give a doctor that particular score rather than giving an English literature student? You feel oneness with the fraternity. And naturally, if my doctors were to correct, they would again feel the same with uh, fellow doctors and not English literature students. They would look down upon each other. So actually, that's exactly the strategy that I employed. And apart from the starting anecdote and the ending conclusion, of course, linking the conclusion with the starting anecdote is a standard strategy that everyone follows. But I think what differently I did was to give a fictional angle, quote not what Gandhi said, Nehru said, Bertrand Russell said, and all your philosophy, but quote, quote instead, you know, William Shakespeare, Sylvia Plath, and O. Henry, and whichever author you like, even, even if it's Tamil authors, it's totally fine. They'll be okay with it, don't worry. As long as, even if they don't understand, it's okay. Even if it's Saint Thiruvalluvar, it's totally still fine. Even if you're not from Tamil, you quote Hindi, Punjabi, whatever you want you quote, it's totally okay. Everything is rewarded. But everything different is rewarded. So that is why you need to ensure that you make some difference to what you write. So quote as many as possible probably from this rather than quoting from the traditional cliche quotes, because everyone is going to do that. Then if he's routinely see, everyone is a human, and it's human nature to see, routinely see papers, and how, how do you think you know someone will be impressed to give you a different score with just writing the same old quotations, unless it's Vikram Greval, so that's a different thing. So I think that's why I made a difference in essay. GS1, I spoiled it, I felt, but then I gave a call to my mom, and then I was blabbering, ranting, and then she said, whatever gone is gone, so just go ahead with GS234, and then there is always this natural vibe and energy, enthusiasm that comes when you speak to someone you allow trust and all that. So with all that energy, I somehow wrote GS2 and I kept my mind. I'll, I'll not leave any question. I'll, not, I'll ensure that I feel irrespective of what I know. There was a question in GS2 on some self-help groups and women's reservation in parliament or legislature. Not parliament. I think it was in the legislature. And that was not something that, again, you know, I knew the answer or anyone would have known for sure. No one would have known. And International Maritime Organization also was asked, I believe. And that is also something not that we cliche read. So for all these questions, again, you know, cooked up answers, totally cooked up, but relatable. What will IMO do? It says maritime. OK, something to do with uh, marine pollution, something to do with piracy, something to do with you know pirates. Start speaking about drug trafficking. Start speaking about hoarding. You know, if nothing comes your way, start uh, speaking about the fish, whales, and whatever comes in the sea. I'll give, write anything, anything is fine. See, naturally, all these organizations do every single thing about all this. You might not know the exact answer, but at least you know the points and the headings under which you need to cover these. So it's about writing as much diverse as possible, as holistic as possible. There was something about security organizations or intelligence. I don't remember exactly what the question was, but I remember quoting, you know, raw about raw, the research and analysis wing, IB and all that for the for that answer. And I don't think that was a cliche answer that was expected. So writing something different in these papers also helps. GS2 was three and all was kind of okay for me. And or okay, even average, above average, whatever you want to call it. GS4, I felt I did really, really well. And of, of course, except for one or two questions, like social capital, I totally got it wrong. So that's something different. Because that's actually a question from the prelims, but somehow it skipped off my mind what social capital was. And I, and I wrote the cliche answer of, you know, building answers on education, health, and all that, though the answer was about building trust. So that was probably the only question that I got entirely wrong, but otherwise it was okay with it. Medical science optional, it's not a very good scoring optional, but no other go. I've chosen, I had to do it. No other uh, no other business. If I had gone for a different optional, I would have probably getting something lesser than this. And like apparently from whatever I saw, I happen to be, I think, the only person who's got less than 100 rank with medical science as the optional. I didn't see a second person, so that will tell you how good an optional it is. So with medical science, of course, unless and until there's a doctor here, I don't think I would advise anyone else to go for a medical science because I, I did see some friends of mine who, who are not doctors uh, attempting medical science, and I was like, have you gone nuts? So that's not something I want you, want you to do. And yeah, with medical science, of course, if you're a doctor, maybe a line or two if I, have, if I were to say, I think, reading the same old textbooks that we had in our 
Yuji, uh, graduation days is all that you need. There's nothing more that you need. And my after, and uh, the very, uh, I would say like post final year when I was done with my final year university exams, I straight away hopped on into writing my actual paper of UPSC. That was like the only paper in medical science I wrote. So there was no in between writing, no test paper, nothing at all, because there's neither a test series. There's only one and I didn't have the time as well. So that was about my medical science journey as a whole. And with respect to the uh, optional papers, as in the language papers, again, that's just for qualifying. And as long as you take it very lightly, I think you, it's still doable. And yeah, so this is this was all about the mains part. So write as many tests as possible and, and do calculated writing. That's what I would say, be it for the prelims or for the mains. For the interview part, again, it's a gamble. Whatever you write, you you know, I mean, whatever you answer, it's all about how they like it. The board you go to, that matters. Your CV, your DAF, it totally matters. Building up on your DAF right away, even before, even if you're not done something right now, it's still okay. But make something relatable in your DAF. Have the knowledge to substantiate what you you know put in your DAF. I should probably not say this, but then I'll you know I'll go a little beyond in saying that even if you put something that you've never done in your life in your DAF, it's still okay. But then, you know, have the expertise to at least you give a confident answer about what you've put in your DAF. If you've never done in your life, still you can read it up. Because naturally, they want you to, you know, shell out your experiences, but naturally, it'll, you know, come to a point where they find out who the person you are. They start talking to you, they'll get it out of your mouth. And sometimes I really felt, you know, that the interview is more GS-based or prelims based. Whatever you've read for your GS prelims mains content is what they ask you back. And there are quite a few questions only which are really asked about your personality. And I've personally never been able to decode what happens in a personality test. But for me, it was totally a different experience though, because I had a very strong CV and I could see the admiration that they had, you know, for the CV part. So that's when I understood, okay, fine. So they respect your CV more and then they judge you and then they ask you questions. So that was how it was. See, all, all of us are judgmental, you know, said then done. We could say that we are not judgmental, but at the end of the day, all of us are judging each other silently or visibly and invisibly. And that's how UPSC also is. They see your CV. If you've done nothing, then naturally, you know, there is this inclination that this fellow is probably not someone who's fit for the services. Being into the administration does not come in a day. You need to have that group. You need to have that personality and the conviction with what you say. If, you're, if you don't stick to you know, what you say and what you feel, then who else will? If you're not able to convince yourself of a cause, no one else will you know, believe on you. And that is the kind of trust and confidence. I did read a transcript where there was someone with an 11th attempt. And he still you know, gave a convincing answer. It was Dasa sir's board. And he made this answer when Dasa sir asked him as to what took him to 11 attempts. He said, Ishwar pe bharosa hai, which is you know, the trust on the Lord and his family, which was being supportive for all the 11 attempts. And of course, he was being a sub collector or a deputy collector through a state a public service commission exam. So I think all this also counts. It is about, you know, capitalizing on the moment and giving a answer with muscle memory. So that is, you know, totally what matters. You need to give a perfect answer at that particular second, at the fraction of a second, which they want you to give. And even one single answer, trust me, can, you know, take you to, to that 200 plus or 190 plus category. Anything that you get beyond 190 is, you know, after that, it's all about luck. Until 190, trust me, it's still doable. But beyond 190, it's all about the person who gives that score and what they feel about you totally. For me, yeah, interview I felt was actually average to above average for me because I was doing really well in the mocks, but then I expected to use all that I had, you know, fancy stuff which I had prepared and naturally, one of my mentors, uh, Mr. Rohit Nadin, who also happens to be currently an IPS and uh, the deputy commissioner in Coimbatore. So he was with Ananaga deputy commissioner before and he trained a lot for the interview and trust me, his training is the best, hands down, again. And uh, of course, I did take uh, quite a few mocks and apart from all this as well, what fancy you can do in the interview if you would ask me. I mean, it's too far-fetched to talk about the interview, but I'll just go on to say this alone. That you should probably have a set of data statistics and fancy quotations which you can use in your answers so that it spells out a difference rather than giving the same old, you know, honest, integral, integrity and whatnot, you know, all the ethics wala answers that we actually say is, they've also, they're also, you know, pretty seasoned and they know everyone is kind of bluffing, you know, at that point. 
bluffing in the sense not entirely but at least partly but then you know they would ask you probably a question say your kid is sick and then you know there's a communal riot running and probably even put yourself uh, put your kid into the death bed and whom would you go to rescue first would it be your kid or would it be the nation's kid so that's how you know questions are framed and naturally everyone will still give the answer that you know i let alone my kid let it go to the hospital and you know you run to save the nation that's how everyone answers and they kind of know that you know everyone will still give this answer but they still go on to ask this question because they want you to see as to what different you still answer and even if you stick to the footing to say i'll take care of my kid because in fact this was one of the answers that the particular person that i told you know he offered to me because i too gave this cliche answer if this question was offered to me i would have told okay i'll just go to rescue the nation's kid because there will be someone else to take care of my kid and then then the actually this was a transcript question and someone and the member probably said what if uh, you were a single parent and then you still had to go and then you know i would have changed it to saying the 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 particular question was so poised where you know the kid was in an icu so i said anyways the doctors are going to take care and being a doctor i'll you know better understand what what actually it feels like and probably i'll just go look that up and they can always take uh, in instructions from me on call so this was the answer that i said but then a different perspective was when you know the particular person i told he gave me a suggestion saying i'll still look after my kid and not the nation's kid because we work in a system there is a hierarchy there is a team to work if i am on leave if i am not there on place that is either my subordinate or that is a distant i mean uh, there is a nearby district collector who will always be there to take into my shoes who will fit into my shoes and do the needful that is why exactly a system exists it's not a one place machinery where if one person doesn't say, uh, doesn't exist then probably the whole system breaks down that's not how it is so i felt okay fine so this is also a different perspective to answer and i felt probably that this answer was even way better because see this is a very realistic answer top down you know like hands down i would go on to say that that answer would have you know fetched a 200 plus and probably that's exactly why he got 230 plus when he was in his attempt for the interview and i don't know my scores but i can uh, you know go on to say that he's way 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 better of course it comes with experience but you know upsc expects you to have that maturity and experience and this thought process at 21 years so that's why this age bar, age bar has been fixed is what i feel so and this of course comes with time it won't come in a day won't expect anyone to know this or won't expect anyone to answer this nor did i nor will you most likely at least as long as there's someone out in the open that's a different uh, game altogether but i think such different things very small 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 different things is what matters of course for the next 60 days there is nothing for you more to think about mains or interview and it's all about prelims but trust me give this attempt on the prelims don't skip an attempt that is not something that at least i will you know advise you to do and in at any point where it comes to you know answering something even if you don't know you know a polite a polite saying of either i'm not very sure or if you give me a chance i'll be able to answer something and let me take a chance and let me take a try you know trying is always something that again upsc supports they want you to try to at least answer for prelims mains interview wherever it is trying is always rewarded in fact one of them when i spoke to you know told me that whatever you write is being given at least a 3 on 10 in your mains so filling the paper at least gets you to a 3 for a question so that's how it is you know important and lastly for the prelims if i were to sum up i think for the next 60 days do what your heart says about reading you really have i think four major subjects to do history ge geography economics and polity these are the four major ones of course there's society ir and i think society and all has a lower uh, lower level of prevalence with respect to the prelims and the ir questions are more and maybe um what else do we have yeah, environment of course environment have been you know more often bizarre questions so reading that except for the ramsar sites national parks the places and like there's always a static portion which again i don't think i'll have to enumerate in the same old static portion is what you need to revise as well dynamic if you get wrong someone else is also going to get it wrong so that you can always do it from a yearly compilation i don't think you need to go for the monthly current affairs magazine you could do a yearly compilation and that still works so i think this is all that you need to do and give as many tests as possible forget it what you write give as many innumerable numbers and uh, uh, you know had a glimpse of the handouts that they give here and the mains question papers the test papers 
because my juniors are also a part of this academy and I've seen them, you know, give the papers and I've uh, looked up it as well, evaluated it sometimes. And I really feel that they've been doing a great job and you should, and you, when you've trusted the process, you probably have to get through it. That's what I totally feel. So don't leave it midway through. Have that consistency, the hard work, the diligence and the smart work added to the confidence that you've put upon you. I think this sums up uh, what I, whatever I wish to say. So I'll probably take up questions if you have any. A short question or session. Art and culture, again, they always say, tell you this one particular chapter, the first chapter, the 60 odd pages, which everyone needs to read. The rest of the chapters, of course, whatever you read, you'll never be able to remember. So that, as much as possible, do read. But if you're not able to read, it's okay. Art and culture can be the last, you know, that you need to focus on. But doesn't mean you totally skip it away. Read the first chapter for sure. The one on paintings as well. So you just have to grade it and read it. That's what I feel for art and culture. Seems like there's an eerie silence. Or is it that I've covered everything or you have no questions? Okay, nothing much except for prelims preparation. Hmm. Someone says that he doesn't know about the syllabus, but then kill a person. Inno kila, inno kila, kile po irena. Yeah. Okay. So someone says that they don't know the syllabus, but that's not something you know. Even UPSC knows because prelims is an open-ended syllabus. There is really nothing much that you can do about the prelims except for the standard resources that probably everyone has been doing. And anything that's asked can be asked in prelims. Of course, they always say that the sky is the limit with respect to the prelims, though. Mains and interview as a whole, I think that is something totally under your control. Interview, of course, that's a different ball game, but mains, yes, you'll still be able to do. My optional was medical science. And yeah, for the mains part, again, previous your questions are pretty important. So have a glimpse of it and ensure that you have at least, you know, the points on hints. Like once if something on maritime is asked, these are the points that you need to cover. Like this has to come out of you in those seven minutes. And the second you see the question, your hands have to go to writing. And if you have a very shabby handwriting, please, please, please try to make it as good as possible, as legible as possible. Legibility is all that matters. It doesn't need to be like, you know, calligraphic handwriting. That's not what they expect. But it needs to be legible because I also feel that good handwritings also get good marks. Because mine is at least good. I, would, I, I don't know if it's great, but it's good. So writing a good handwriting definitely gets you marks because people, people are able to understand what you write. If I don't get to understand, I won't sit with your answer for at least more than five minutes. That's not going to do. Everyone is tired. So naturally, in that case, I would probably be inclined to give you an average score instead of giving an extraordinary score. So if you really want a good score, I think it's about inching towards also a legible handwriting and presenting it decently. And if you write some committee, I think that's a keyword which you can underline. Forget the routine keyword underlining, but at least the committee part you know, the most important parts, maybe you could try. So what else? If you guys ever want to connect, you could always connect on Insta or WhatsApp as well. I'll drop my number as well. If you really guys want to ask something, you could ask on that. 86. Five double six eight six zero eight one five nine five double six. Insta is on tricky ha binga underscore tricky underscore ha binga. If you don't feel free asking here, you could always drop a text on that. Of course, for the next one day, it's going to be really hectic, but 
I'll definitely take the time out to answer you on that. So yeah, all the best on that. So should we close this? If no one has a question. What makes difference from other answers in mains? I think I told you all the differences that I made at least from others' answers, especially current affairs revision frequency. Current affairs revision frequency, I don't think it really matters because you really don't know if that is what he's going to ask you. So you read it once or twice, it's going to be the same. But at least reading once, trying to remember as much as possible is worth. Current affairs for prelims is worth it or not. It is worth, but you'll have to again take a calibrated approach because at the last moment, I think it's about reading more dynamic than, sorry, more static than the dynamic part. How many hours of study, especially last two months of prelims, how many revision? Revision as long as you start remembering stuff. Until that, you need to revise. You need to skim. How many hours of study? It totally varies. It, it is from person to person, totally. There is no one unique strategy. But OK, for me, it has been even three hours. Some days, it has been eight hours also. So it totally de depends. Someone wants me to repeat the mobile number, 8608159566. I'm a college student of first year. When to start the UPSC preparation? Probably at the third year or fourth, or if you want after that, totally up to you. So how to clear first attempt? <laughs> if you have enough luck, maybe you will, along with diligence. Sir, so from where you completed your current affairs compilation, this, I think, totally depends on what you like. Any current affairs compilation of an annual compilation will do. I tried doing the monthly ones, but that was worst. Like, I really couldn't remember, so this is better. Insta idea again. <laughs> Tricky underscore Harbinger. I have covered the sources that I chose in the first place, but I completing. I came across new material online. You could, you know, look up new material, but I don't think that's needed because the knowledge is kind of endless and you'll never be able to cover every single thing. So I think it's totally not necessary. One single compilation that you read, I think Vajrams is far enough. I, I do remember reading the Vajrams compilation for my prelims because it had the topics listed in the first page and it was into three volumes. Like this was the first institute that kind of released it. So I was like, okay, fine. So this is, uh, you know, a good strategy to at least read and, you know, keep up on the topics. So that was one. Can in-service doctors able to crack? That depends on your state service. If they allow you to write your exam, then you're good to go. Mm. What else are we missing out? Do note making from the Hindu. OK, so I think I've never touched upon newspapers. And like on the topic about newspapers, for prelims, I think newspapers, I personally believe, are not going to help. Like I don't know if this is what toppers say or not, but let alone that, I've never read, like I did read newspapers in the start, but I don't think it ever helped for prelims at least. For mains, yes, it will help you because you start getting the mastery over the language, you read editorials, you get opinions, you start developing that answer writing ability. For mains, it will help you, trust me. But in fact, the Indian Express and Hindu needs to be done for the mains more because they ask questions straight away from that. There was a question on unemployment which came up in a Hindu editorial and uh, I totally missed out on it. And I landed up writing whatever I knew. But if you've written that, probably you would have gotten a mark or two extra. So I think reading the newspaper definitely does help for the mains. But for the prelims, I don't know. I don't think it does. For the interview, yes, because they do ask you current affairs stuff. So these are all the things that I think with respect to the Hindu or the Indian Express. And if it's for the interview, you start reading Mint, it's even better. Mint, I felt, was in an even better newspaper than Hindu or the Indian Express between newspapers and English comprehension. Again, it depends on the level of fluency that you have in English and the command and mastery over the language. Because if you're kind of OK with it, then I don't think you need a newspaper. We feel more lazy how to overcome. The, ver the very fear of writing prelims, again, will you know help you overcome everything. If you don't want to sit for the prelims you know, again after this particular attempt, then that is how you, you should you know put laziness down. Did you do meditation? Sorry, I didn't do meditation. Mm where you completed your coaching. It's all, uh, all it's all in bits and pieces. How to make strategy for UPSC preparation and note making stuff. Note making, personally for me, I don't think it, uh, it helps unless and until you have a one page note or a two page note, something that you can read 
for the interval or one night before. If you have a notebook alone as a note, then I think it, it doesn't help. It probably will not help. If I have to make my strategy for UPSC preparation, I just want to start and what things should be focused before preparation. Nothing to focus except for you know what you're reading. If you if you stop focusing on other stuff, peripheral stuff, if you know what I mean, then probably you should get through. How many hours do you study? Depends. Sometimes one hour, sometimes no hour. Like I don't even know if I should tell this, but you know, I watch soap operas every single day. Between GS one and two and three and four, that particular night I was sitting and watching Edin Nichol and discussing about how Adi Gunashekar must have been belittling the women in the society and all that. So that's how much a fond I am of soap operas, something that has come, you know, from my childhood with my grandma. So, so you know, you do need to have relaxation as well. Of course, when to do that is a matter of your decision and your call. But even even on the day of interview, I was sitting and watching Suragadi Kaase. <laughs> So that's how much you know I'm fond of doing all this. And so really terming me a bookworm or a nerd is not something that will actually match. Medical science optional. If you really wish to ask me, I think you should ask me on text or call because that's not something that the majority of the audience will want. Content provided by the coaching, is it sufficient? I think it's sufficient because they do have content that they've curated over the years. So that def definitely does help. In fact, for my mains, for society, IR, and uh, I think what else do we have as peripheral subjects? Even environment, I would say. I think for all these, being very dynamic, I followed only the main 365 editions that come out from institutes. There was no other material that I followed per se. There was no standard textbook per se as well. How many years of integral preparation do you do? Eight months is all I had because I was just post my internship and August 5, 2022 was exactly when I started. With the ancient and medieval, Initially, I read this book on by Satish Chandra and all that, but I understood that all that was a waste because I remembered nothing at the end of the day. Stuck to just doing, you know, ready reckoner notes that we get on Telegram. Even Telegram is way better because you have different notes in it which are very concise by toppers. I think there's some notes by Rishikesh Reddy which I followed, so that helped a lot. Note making, no, that I I don't feel it helps. Science and tech, very dynamic. Do all the static part which they give you in your main 365 series from institutes. That helps. One subject in a day or multiple. Again, your call. If you feel one subject, you could do, you could binge. It's OK. For me, I felt I would lose the continuity doing you know, environment in the morning, history in the afternoon. This was not something I could do. Instead, I would binge on Spectrum, try to finish it probably in four or five days, as fast as possible. It's OK. Even if I don't remember, it's fine. Four to five days, I, I need to complete Spectrum, and then I would move on for the next. And then again, come back to Spectrum for a second revision or third. At least 10 to 15 times you should have read. There is no other go. How did you complete the entire syllabus? Half big completion, but I think these tricks help me. Yeah, I think most of the questions are done. And if there are any more, probably you could connect on Insta or, uh, or WhatsApp or Telegram. The same has all the three sources. OK, then I'll get going. Thank you. So uh, I hope this session was very informative. Uh, personally, I like this session uh, because uh, Prashant brought in, I think, the human aspect of preparation, like he was telling about watching serials and all, because I also used to do that during preparation. So I finally found someone who was having interest in Tamil soap operas, because during my time, I used to watch all those uh, Metioli and you know, everything was going on. I mean, I'm talking of those days. One inspiration could also be Dior Batiham. <laughs> yeah, Dior Batiham and everything was there. So, so, uh, so ultimately, the, the point that is being made here is, apart from the nuances that he was talking of subject-wise, uh, this exam is a human exam, right? All of us are human beings. All of us have emotions. All of us have highs and lows every day. So the point is just be very consistent and diligent in your preparation. And as he was very clearly telling, if smart work, luck and everything falls in place and stars are also in place, uh, you will definitely find your name in the list. And that's our hope and wish from Bajiram's end also. 
So I would like to thank Prashant a lot because this is the day in which the results have come and uh, is in fact the time of your enjoyment and everything. But then you took time uh, just to guide aspirants like this. Uh, I think that's a very, very big yeoman service that you're doing to the club of aspirants. So I thank you on behalf of Ajiram for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Right. So thank you one and all for attending this session. We can conclude the session. Thank you. <clears throat>